Good afternoon and welcome to the College of Complexes, our first in-person meeting in two and a half years, kind of a light, yes, kind of a light turnout. A little bit of administrative rules if you're on Zoom. Uh, we can uh, open the comments tonight. But uh, again, since it is a live format, the computers are allowed. We just ask that you guys uh, keep everything uh, going kind of well. And again, we're going to run our standard format tonight. We have two speakers tonight, each of about 20 minutes. The last questions, it's going to be uh, Justin and Ernie. And they'll each introduce their various topics. But first, um, I'm going to have Charlie come up and uh, open up our traditional announcements period. It'll be announcements, then it'll be our speakers, questions and answers, and then our um, rebuttal format, our infamous rebuttal format. And again, there's two rules, one full at a time, and second is no personal attacks. Uh, that means I can't call, call Charlie a schmuck, but I guess... I'm in person. I'm afraid to get one stop now. So go ahead. There's Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. Oh. Charlie. Okay. Be welcome to meeting number 2691 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people we think. So we'll see how this bicameral presentation mode. Uh, works. It's kind of intriguing. It's sort of like the College of Complexes. I was thinking we've got a television network. I don't know if we're going to rival CNN. <laughs> and not need to press off the news off the air. But uh, uh, we will feature, as usual, a stellar uh, schedule. Okay, okay let's see. Uh, first of all, in during the period we were off, I wanted to acknowledge our technician here, Tim Bulger, who I think I'd like to mention, he volunteers in a number of activities, but he was recognized by the uh, uh, Postmasters for a recipient of it's something like a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's the highest award you can meet at Toastmasters. The highest, the very highest award. It's called the Distinguished Toastmaster Award. The Distinguished Toastmaster. So we have someone of, of accolade in our of notes. <laughs> and, and anyhow, but I guess it takes a lot of work to, to justify even getting nominated, qualifying for it. You have to do all kinds of things uh, prior to it. Uh, unlike the college of complexes, where you just have to show up. Yeah. <laughs> You're qualified. But uh, congratulations in all seriousness. Thanks. Hit them on Thank you, Charlie. And, uh, you know, the invitation extends to anybody in that organization if they'd like to speak to the college. Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, we'll see how this goes, folks. An experimental phase. I'm the guy who's not afraid of new and different experiences. Unlike some others, I'm not afraid of technology. Uh, but anyhow, although I am not a capitalist, by the way, I usually I want to have, uh, give it all advertisement. We do maintain a Google email group and a uh, Yahoo group or a meetup group. So if you want notices about upcoming program at the college, uh, now the changes that we run with this first meeting where I'm meeting at five o'clock, uh, we should remain the same. Um, but we had to move up an hour early because the restaurant closes. Uh, so that's basically the only change that it is in effect. Now, uh, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our next week's program. 
with the leafy green used first used truly barrels prayed on us and it's a browser. I have been studying this for quite a while, but I'm going to be presenting somewhat of a historical two-part program, actually. One first part historical and the other one up to date, establishing the conflict that the ongoing conflict of nearly a hundred years between communism and fascism. There's a dichotomy that's been uh, a hot war and a cold war. Uh, we see it reappearing again uh, within the United States political spectrum, which I will establish. But um, my primary topic will concern what took place in World War II on the Eastern Front. We're, we are given great deals of documentaries and information on D-Day, the Battle of Normandy and the liberation of Europe. And I believe most Americans have little or no understanding of the, the immense amount of conflict that took place over a period of several years on the Eastern Front. Some of the largest battles ever to took place in, in any conflict anywhere in the history of mankind. So there's, and then now we see again, uh, there was um, a feature, uh, Kiev was, as a matter of fact, one of the battles that are within the Ukraine uh, perimeter. But anyhow, now uh, that leaves open, we've got uh, November uh, 19th and 26th open. If you'd like to speak, kindly contact me by email or by phone with a title and a short description of your program if you'd like to speak. Okay, that's about it. Tim, thank you very much. And welcome everyone to this, uh, our something of reunion here. Thank you. By the way, I was gonna, I haven't put anything together yet, but I was going to put together something like the college campus's transportation system. Now, this is be very informal. Some people come here by car. So many people come here by public transportation. Um, there are occasions where arrangements can be made between people who drive to maybe pick somebody up. Uh, we used to have a South Side group like this. And I used to contribute to it in Wallace. And we have a group that came from Science Park to pick up one or two people. And then I'd, I'd always throw in a few bucks and so forth to buy a dinner for the driver of the automobile. We did that for years. I'd like to reinstate that because there are occasions where I'm asked by speakers, uh, can I get a ride or can I get, and I don't know precisely as is. So we will putting a little structure to it. Maybe if all I need is your name, um, if you have a vehicle and uh, what part of the city you, you're coming from and you live in, and we'll leave arrangements if you can work it up among yourselves. But I think it would be an added feature uh, that we should do is to have a transportation system so that we take care of the first and last mile and enable everyone on an equitable basis to attend these informative lectures. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Charlie, Are there any more announcements for the floor? Any more announcements for the floor real quick or not? All right. Um, if Ben, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Ernie or? Uh... All right, Justin, the floor is now yours. All right. You ready, sir? What's up, guys? So, um, thanks, uh, college, for meeting back in person. It's, uh, it's really good to be back. Meeting in person, seeing you guys again in the flesh. Um, 
So I uh, I didn't really have much uh, to discuss other than what the Libertarian Party is up to. Um, it's we got the election in a few days, so that's been basically what my focus has been the past few days. So if you voted for a Libertarian in the primary, or if you donated to a Libertarian Party candidate or the party, or did any sort of advocacy for the LP or one of our candidates, I want to say thank you. It's because of you guys that we are in the position that we are. We have five countywide um, candidates here in Cook County, and we got three candidates in our commissioner districts. So um, to anybody who helped contribute to that, thank you. Um, a little background, um, the requirements to get into Cook County office, uh, especially countywide, like for, for county board president, it was about the same as running for Illinois governor. Um, 25,000 signatures minimum. Uh, in 2020, with the pandemic, uh, we sued the state of Illinois and they gave us a break. We only got to collect 10% of that. Um, and um, Libertarian Party of Chicago took advantage of that situation. We ran several candidates. One of our candidates, a friend of the college, you guys may know, Brian Denning, he was our, our state's attorney candidate, and he got about 7% of the vote. And that established us in Cook County. So we are on equal footing with Democrats and Republicans in Cook County, um, as far as the law is concerned. Uh, that brings us to this year, 2022. Um, in addition to our countywide candidates, we also have a slate of statewide candidates as well. I'll get to those later, but uh, for our countywide slate, um, you know, uh, we had to collect about 2,000, well, 2,500 2, minimum in 2020. With the 7% that Brian did, he got that meant our signature threshold for office was about 500 signatures minimum. Uh, so we were able to collect about 1,500 signatures, which is significantly less than 2020 or again, unestablished uh, threshold. And uh, that was a whole volunteer effort. And because of that, we got five candidates on the ballot here in Cook County. Um, we, uh, we also, as I mentioned, have a statewide slate. And I'll just go on from there, I suppose. <laughs> uh, the state slate, uh, this you know, in, as far as statewide goes, the Libertarian Party is not considered established, but in Cook County it is, in several other, um, several other counties. So our governor, lieutenant governor, senate, all those guys, uh, twenty-five thousand is minimum was what we needed, and we collected a different petition period. Than the um, the county wide. So our our governor candidate is Scott Schluter. Scott Schluter is a mechanic. He's an Air Force vet. He's a father. Uh, he's running a classic radical libertarian platform for governor. Um, he uh, is pro Second Amendment. He is anti corruption. He is pro ethics reform. Um, he's got a website, scotchschluter.com. You can learn more about Scott Schluter. Um, our Senate candidate, Phil Redpath. Phil Redpath uh, is the former chair of the National Libertarian Party. He's a perennial candidate. He's ran for offices in Virginia and other places. 
Um, and he is probably the biggest expert in the United States about ballot access issues. Um, he wants to end the wars. He wants to restore civil liberties. He wants sound fiscal policy. Um, so Bill Redpath for US Senate, please vote for Bill. Our Lieutenant Governor candidate is John Phillips. Um, as you know, um, Governor and Lieutenant Governor run together. So with Scott Schluter is John Phillips. He's also a mechanic. He's also in the Libertarian Party activist. As, um, he was on the Libertarian National Committee representing Illinois and several other states on the National Committee. And um, like Scott, shares a lot of the same platform. Um, our attorney general candidate is Dan Robin. Dan Robin is a retired lawyer. He lives in Schaumburg. Um, he just retired during the pandemic. He's also an author. He wrote a book called The Libertarian War on Poverty, uh, which talks about libertarian solutions to poverty. Um, and he also uh, spoke to the college a little while back. Our Secretary of State candidate is John Stewart. Now, our original candidate was a man named Jesse White. Um, Jesse White uh, circulated a great number of petitions and was instrumental in us getting on the ballot. However, the Democrats did not like the idea of us running a guy named Jesse White. So they came after us. And um, they basically bullied uh, Jesse off the ballot. And with that, we were able to put a gentleman, John Stewart, on the ballot. John Stewart is uh, a former professional wrestler. You may know him as the illustrious John Stewart. But now uh, he run, help runs a, his uh, family car dealership in Deerfield. Um, I'm sorry? Northwest side. He lives in Deerfield. Sorry. In his dealerships on the northwest side? Or it was a police. Okay. So he lives in Deerfield. I don't know where the dealership is. But um, uh, but as a, as a car dealership, he deals with the Secretary of State's office all the time. So he's probably the most qualified person running for Secretary of State. He's also been in politics for a long time, ran for office several times. Uh, and um, please vote for John Stewart. Our treasurer candidate, Preston Nelson, he lives downstate. Um, he's a party activist going back several years. Uh, he joined our chapter and one of the ideas he has is about, um, oh gosh, do you remember which, which was it fruit, uh, was it wheat or something or fruit? oats? Oats. He wanted to make our, he had an idea of oats being the base of the currency. Uh, interesting conversation, but he's a party activist. Uh, he's, um, been around Illinois a while. He's also a model. He's been, you know, to China to do work. So Preston for treasurer. Um, our comptroller candidate is a world-class historian and economist and a transgender icon. Her name is Deidre McCloskey. She's the professor emeritus at University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, she also taught at University of Chicago. Uh, very accomplished academic, um, and she's our comptroller candidate. So please vote for Deidre McCloskey, trans icon, or comptroller if you want a real, uh, really smart person in charge of paying our state's bills. Um, we can go with that. Um, Cook County Board President, Thea Satsos. She ran for Congress about 20 years ago. Um, and she's our Cook County Board President. She works at a hospital. She works in a lab. She's a mother. 
She uh, is running basically an educational campaign uh, to tell people about the Libertarian Party and to help us grow, to help with our ballot access. So thank you, Thea, for, for running. And please vote for Thea for Cook County Board President. I think some of you guys here know Thea already. Uh, Joe Schreiner, he's our Cook County Clerk candidate. He's ran for office several times in the past as a libertarian. He's got a few master's degrees or maybe even a few PhDs, I'm not sure. But you can go to josephschreiner.org to learn more about his professional career. He's running for clerk. He won, he's running on a transparency campaign. And he's also running uh, uh, to speak out against lockdowns. So um, Joe Schreiner, he's also a patent agent, I believe. And he was a translator, so he knows German. So Joe Schreiner, please vote for him for county clerk. We also got Brad Sandifer, uh, who's a sergeant uh, in the sheriff's department. He's running for sheriff. He is um, a PhD candidate. He's uh, been on the force for 30 plus years. He's worked in corrections and uh, as uh, uh, you know, on the beat. He spoke at the college a few years, or not a few years back, a few weeks, months back. Um, and he had a very good discussion here. So some of you guys may be familiar with Brad Sandifer. Uh, he also uh, has a real soft spot for helping the mentally ill in, in our in the jails. And he wants to, you know, he wants to prevent crime by tackling, you know, the roots of some of these issues. So consider voting for Brad Sandifer for Cook County Sheriff. Um, Michael Murphy, Cook County Treasurer, transplant from Michigan, um, running a paper campaign more or less, but th we, we thank him for, for stepping up. Um, so if you want a libertarian uh, in the, uh, on the county board looking over the finances, Michael Murphy is your guy. Now our assessor candidate is a very interesting guy, Nico Satsoulis. Uh, Nico is Greek. He ran for office as a libertarian in Greece for parliament. He's from Athens, um, lives in Hyde Park, uh, went to University of Chicago. Um, basically his tax bill went up like 400%. So he said he's gonna run for assessor. Um, he's the only libertarian candidate Running state, uh, running countywide. It's in a two-way race, so it's him and Fritz Kiegi, uh, who's the incumbent Democrat as the assessor. So it's very possible that Nico gets more votes than any Republican in Cook County. Which, if that were to happen, that'd be huge, and that would mean that the the Libertarian Party is stronger. Uh, at this juncture than the GOP in Cook County. So also Nico is more likely going to continue uh, extend our ballot access beyond 2024 to 2026. So Nico's got the best chance uh, as a statewide candidate to really shake things up. So vote for Nico Satsoulis um, for Cook County Assessor. Um, We have some Cook County Board of Commissioner candidates. In District 1, we got Jim Humay. Jim Humay is, um, Jim Humay works in sales. Uh, he's a party activist. He's also involved uh, in several causes and in kind of like artistic scene circles. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> this district is, is uh, the west, parts of the west side of Chicago, Oak Park, Ukrainian Village, and some other suburbs over that way. Um, he's in a two-way race against uh, Brandon Johnson, who's now running for mayor. So his candidate is the his candidate, the incumbent, is running two campaigns at once. But Jim uh, is only going to focus uh, on the people. So if you live in District 1, Cook County Board of Commissioner District 1, please vote for Jim Humay. Uh, in the 5th District, we've got Jason 
Decker. Jason Decker has been a community activist for a while. Uh, he's been he's been boarding up uh, abandoned homes down in Harvey and with Lothian and several other uh, communities there in South Cook County. Um, so he knows a bunch of people. Uh, he's probably got the best chance of winning. He's also in a two-way race. Um, and he's got a lot of grassroots support in his in his district. And I'm really impressed with how he's been able to be just a powerhouse uh, there in his district doing things uh, himself and just really, really getting his name out there. So if you live in the fifth uh, Board of Commissioners district, please vote for Jason Decker. And then we got Brandon Size Love in District 11. Uh, Brandon, um, uh, Brandon, his wife and his daughter, they all live out there. It's like Midway. That's like, um, it's like, uh, you know, it's like Madigan ish territory, right? Um, so um, he's right. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he lives in the Devil's District. Uh, so he, he can see the corruption right there uh, you know, with his own eyeballs. Um, so if you're, if you, he's in a three-way race. So, um, you know, despite that, we wish him the best of luck. And if we could please, if you, if you live in District 11, please vote for Brandon Size Love. Um, also with a few, I got a few minutes left. I also want to encourage you guys to vote no on Amendment 1. Um, we, we, uh, we, uh, one full at a time, one full at a time, one full at a time. So, uh, if you think that unions are corrupt now and have, uh, contributed to the decay of the state, just imagine how much worse it would be if Amendment 1 passes. So, for that reason, it's why we encourage you to vote no. And um, again, vote for libertarians. Uh, please do so. Uh, that helps us out. They get some more choices on the ballot. We can actually have a functioning democracy um, and we can work for change. Uh, and that is it. Can you, can, can you do a couple about the candidates in McHenry County? McHenry County. So we got a few in McHenry County. Uh, I don't have. I didn't. Uh, I don't recall the the exact offices, but uh, you've got um, Ken, Mattis. Ken Mattis from a county McHenry County board. You got Jake Justin also running for county board, and then you have uh, for McHenry treasurer you have Jim Young. So Jim Young. Uh, you know, if you live in McHenry County, Jim Young's ballot access race. So if he gets 5% or more, Libertarians continue to be established in McHenry County. So vote for all, you know, vote, you know, no matter where you live in the state, vote Libertarian. Yes. Uh, Amendment one basically it, it adds a language to the Constitution that said that that enshrines the right to organize to form a union. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, um, and, and you already have those rights. Um, and there's it's not I don't you know we're not against this because we're against people organizing and and lobbying and negotiating entering into contracts with other private organizations, but we, we just feel that uh, with the climate here in Illinois, with how much unions are already um, very, very influential, um, That's bad. We, we think that uh, it's in there, it's bad there, to have influence. And one full at a time, it's sir. It's not bad to have influence, it's but it's bad, bad to collude and, and be corrupt. It's time, sorry. It's bad to have influence. <laughs> one full at a time. There's, it's not bad to have influence, it's, but it is bad to, to be corrupt and to engage in corruption. Uh, the teachers union, Chicago teachers union. What? What about the last case? When was the last case? I don't know that so they're only corrupt if I know when the cases are. 
Yeah, well, I'll call the next year. But that's all I have. Are we doing, Q, are we doing we a Q&A after? Yes, we are. Okay, so I, I have yeah, nothing else. Uh, unless it, right, we're doing a Q&A later, I guess I'll. Thank you, Justin. All right. Thank you. Now Thank on to other matters. Yeah, We've got too. Ernie for another 20 minutes. So, uh, Ernie, you're uh, ready to speak. All right, and as you can see, we're back in true form again here at the college. Order. Thank you, Tim. He has too much influence. Charlie has way too much influence. All right. Yeah. Now everybody should should thank me because no, in fact I'm a hero. Undoubtedly, the food will come any second now. There you go. <laughs> uh, um. Yeah. Um, my name is Ernie Norman. I think both of you know me for many years here at college. Um, I originally had my talk entitled Violence in America, Its Causes and How to Prevent It. And when I thought about it, well, that was probably a little bit of an ambitious topic to take on for 10 minutes to talk. So I am focusing it uh, on some other issues. I am working on a future talk, however, about violence worldwide throughout history and why we should embrace it. But that's a whole different talk, topic to come up in the future. There we go. I, I told you so. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to limit my discussion here to two aspects of violence. There's a lot of violence in the United States, but I am going to limit it to uh, what I call mass violence, mass, mass shoot usually mass shooting incidents and uh, re, uh retribution violence usually uh gang related uh those two topics uh, i would like to go into a little detail on other types of violence domestic violence big problem um uh, violence in the commission of a crime also a big problem but this is a different thing uh road rage etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of these things uh, are topics of interest, but for tonight, I want to just uh, talk about uh, these two. Uh, probably I'll start with uh, mass violence. We're hearing a lot of things about people, uh, shooters going into schools, going into supermarkets and other places and, and killing a large number of people. Uh, and of course, this is terrible. But a couple of things that I would like to bring up about uh, this type of violence. First of all, the actual numbers of victims are in terms of uh, the big picture is really very small. Uh, we've got maybe a few hundred mass violence incidents per year. And, and uh, a, a mass violence is defined as three or more people uh, being victims, okay? Now, this three or more people could very easily be involved in a domestic violence situation, commission of a crime, road rage, et cetera. Some of these other categories are really quite different in nature. Uh, and the, the nature of the things that I'm wanting to talk about are cases where people, because of some form of, of grudge that they have, uh, they will take a weapon and go into a place, often a place where they're known, or they have been involved on some basis or another, a school where they were a student, uh, an a, a, a place of work where they were an employee, et cetera, and they will kill some people. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a totally different situation than these other things. And usually uh, there's a mental health issue here. And uh, as far as, as how to deal with it, oh, and another thing about all of the cases that I'm gonna talk about, uh, I contend that the number of victims uh, in the grand picture is not really very large, but the media grabs onto these for whatever reason. There's a school shooting, uh, a gangland shooting of some sort is on the news quite a bit. And so we, we don't really look at the, the big picture. Uh, the big picture, um, some of the most recent data that I was able to find, or maybe better, there were 37,000 in 2016. 37,000 um, uh, homicides in, in uh, 2016, excuse me, gun deaths in 2016. 
Of those 22,000 were suicides. One of the first things we want to realize about gun deaths, two thirds approximately throughout history. These numbers change a little bit from year to year, but the percentages tend to stay uh, the same. And uh, about two thirds of gun deaths are suicides. And this is certainly a big problem, but it's a different type of problem uh, that I'm wanting to talk about here tonight. I mean, although again, uh, suicide, mental health issue. And here our, our, our city council a few years ago in their infinite wisdom cut us down uh, from 12 mental health clinics in the city to six, I believe, mostly inconveniently located. And at one time before that, there were 24. So obviously I think we're not taking the right path on, on that. With regards to the school shootings here, Sandy Hook, your Uvalde's, uh, Parkland and so on and so forth, Almost uh, always, we can cut this back to a mental health problem. And and uh, two ways to go up, go with that: look for look for signs that there's a problem. Uh, one of the things we could do is have mandatory uh, uh, health exams, mental health exams, every year in certain situations. And uh, people don't like to, to anything like that, but it would probably uh, find some cases that were could be a serious problem in, in the future. So uh, the other the other aspect of both of these things, the gangland shootings and the mass shootings in schools and other institutions, often there are guns involved. And people like to say, well, we can solve all these problems if we get rid of the guns. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a rather uh, old fashioned view on this, uh, frankly, it's, it's uh, the guns are a tool. Uh, the guns don't really kill people. People kill people. We have to work with people who are having mental health, health issues or other issues uh, to reduce that violence. Uh, I am a gun rights advocate, but I'm also an advocate for much more stringent gun laws. Uh, we should develop effective way, ways of identifying weapons Guns do have some serial numbers on them, but they can generally be uh, taken off. There should be other methods, and there should be uh, high penalties for people who sell guns to people who should not have them. Uh, and uh, I would be a strong advocate for that. And guns should be licensed uh, to a given individual. So if a gun is used in a crime, you can trace it. And, and penalize the person and even the original sellers of the guns. Uh, that would be a partial, uh, that would reduce the, the, the violence. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to blame guns. We have, we have uh, you know, some 30,000 gun deaths a year in our country uh, and, and there are 200 million guns. So the, the fraction of people who die from guns is really, really very small. But again, uh, as the newspaper people say and the TV people say, if it bleeds, it leads. And so we hear about all this quite a lot uh, on TV, on the radio, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, get, getting a little off track here. Uh, with regard to mass killings, the thing, the, the particularly school shootings, you usually, oh, oh, I'm gonna add one more thing while I was talking about gun regulations. Uh, I think that, that uh, weapons, uh, any kind of a gun or weapon should not, not only not be sold to, but not be allowed to be in the possession of somebody under 25 years of age. Possible exception is, is parents taking uh, a kid out hunting or something like that. Uh, but other than that, uh, uh, people should not have access, not just not be able to buy them, but not have access to any kind of serious weapons until they're 25 years of age or older. Possible exception for people that are that have police experience uh, at that age, military experience or something like that. Uh, and there should be mandatory gun training for anybody who wants to own any type of a gun, mandatory gun safety training. Uh, and this, uh, I, I, you know, I think it would not hurt to have some mandatory gun safety training starting in kindergarten. And in fact, some, some places do that. They, they show guns to kids and they say, what are you going to do if you see this? The answer is tell an adult. 
Uh, it's very basic, but if we start and have this kind of training, guns are dangerous, and and uh, started that at a very young age, uh, that would be very, very helpful. And if I did, I would say also one of the things you should do in a gun safety training course is uh, in addition to all the things about what safety is and how you don't point the gun at somebody when it's loaded, uh, da, da da da, all these other very common sense things, and some are a little more technical. Uh, the course should end with maybe a one hour video of bodies in the street bleeding, mothers screaming over the deaths of their children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things like this, which would perhaps personalize the danger of what can, guns can do and probably and hopefully put a little sense into the heads of the people who have them. Uh, enough on guns in general. Uh, as far as mass shootings, the thing that strikes me the most, uh, clearly it's a mental health issue, but we very, very seldom hear much from the perpetrators. In other words, are we, we don't, we, we aren't told why did this person do this? It's kind of brushed over. The guy who shot up the supermarket in Buffalo, yes, he had he had some kind of manifesto, a white, a white supremacy manifesto on the internet if people wanted to bother reading. There are a few cases like that, but generally nobody really goes into any depth, at least not where the information is publicly available as to what caused this person, particularly young people in school, to, to feel so frustrated and angry that they went and took a gun and shot a bunch of people. Uh, again, it's usually people they know directly or indirectly, students in their own school, people within the company they work for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, this, I think, is very important. I think I, my suspicion is there's a lot of bullying going on. We know that bullying is a problem in schools, but we don't ever hear afterwards that well, this person who who uh, went and got a gun was bullied by a lot of people. Uh, I suspect that they were, but the, the administrators of the schools don't particularly want people to know that they don't have bullying under control. And there should be uh, uh, regulations um, and, and administrators should have the power of suspension, uh, at least over kids who are bullying other kids because this is part of the problem. And as I said earlier, possible mandatory mental health exams, probably in every school once a year or more often, if counselors available, some schools counselors are available, some are not, to talk to kids who are suffering from frustrations. And that would possibly, uh, uh, possibly catch a few cases before they become a tragedy. Um, again, one of the things that bothers me a little bit when I hear about one of these mass shootings, oh well, 10 people were killed, 12 people were killed, uh, 15 people were killed in a mass shooting in a supermarket or in a school. Uh, we have more, in Chicago, we have about that many people killed uh, every week in Chicago. And we don't, we hear about that a little, here in Chicago we hear about it, but it doesn't have the same attention on a national level that uh, a school shooting has. Uh, so we really, uh, the bigger problem is what I call the retribution killings, uh, usually gangland killings and revenge for one of their friends or one of their, their uh, you know, their homeboys getting shot by somebody from another gang. And uh, the, the police will tell us, they'll admit that they don't have a very good record on, on closing those cases. Uh, and the reason that they don't, that the police are not trusted and the courts are not trusted by people in certain areas. And uh, I think with possible good reason, if someone that is important to you is killed in certain places, uh, if you go through the courts, it's gonna be years and the perpetrator may very well uh, get off with a light sentence or get off entirely. And a lot of people say, no, no, we're not gonna sit for that. We're gonna wait five years and then the guy's gonna get out. We're gonna settle it right here, right now in the neighborhood. And that's what they're doing. They, they have established their own uh, system of policing and, and justice. The police again admit that they have a low closure rate. Uh, I, I contend, yeah, the police 
uh, have a light, low closure rate, but there's not necessarily a low closure rate on these incidents because the people are, are developing their own method of closure uh, because they don't want to wait, they don't trust the system. So I, I blame a lot of that problem on the courts. The courts are just very slow, very inefficient. And if you talk to lawyers, they'll give you a good explanation as to why it takes years and years to try a case. I think we need to uh, somehow vastly increase, increase the speed with which these cases are handled because otherwise they're gonna be handled in the street. And if, if, they, if there were uh, a method by which they were handled more quickly, um, uh, more quickly through our traditional court system, possibly we could uh, reduce some of the retribution killing that goes on. And we could develop a, 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 not necessarily just a respect, but at least a, a, an understanding between law enforcement and the people in, in certain uh, neighborhoods. Um, let's see, reforming the court. One of the ways we could reform courts, perhaps more judges, maybe we need more judges. We do have now technology where we can determine fairly quickly uh, if someone is in fact guilty or involved in a crime. We've got lots of video, uh, lots of, of uh, of chemical tests and so forth that can be done where we can determine pretty quickly whether uh, you know somebody was in fact involved in a crime. And we could perhaps lighten up on the double jeopardy issue. Uh, and go to get some conviction a little earlier, but if new information comes in, there could be a second trial. We did part of our our legal tradition not to have double jeopardy, but maybe we should reconsider uh, on that. And we should have more easy appeals, uh, not just for the defendants, but appeals for the victims or the families of the victims of crimes. In other words, if a, if a conviction uh, comes down or does not come down, that the, uh, the victims would have some kind of an ability through the legal system uh, to file an appeal. Uh, I talked about mental health support already uh, at, at all levels, anti-bullying uh, policies. Um, I think that covers most of what, what I wanted to cover, and I, I suspect that, I, that some people are going to disagree with this, and I'm prepared for that, but I'm going to try and at least, at least keep at least partial part of my dinner before we get into okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Very good. Uh, before we start the Q&A, uh, I would like to open it up um, to anybody else who might want to speak for about five or maybe 10 minutes or so on, on, the, on the subject of that. So uh, David Zucker, you want to come up for a few minutes and yeah. say a few words before we get started with the Q&A? Okay. Okay. All right, I had nothing organized prepared, but I'll say the following. First of all, with regard to the attempt on the life of Paul Pelosi and on the threats that were made against Darren Bailey, Darren Bailey has made allegations that somehow that um, Governor Pritzker's attack ads, Governor Pritzker's ads are responsible for divisive spirit. Well, he's wrong. Paul Pelosi, the attack on Paul Pelosi, that opened a Pandora's box at this point. So it's now open season on everybody. And granted, I rather expected that the attacks, as I have long known, as most of you have, just as the right wing has its share of, has its lunatic fringe, and its share of kooks who can do stuff like that to Paul Pelosi, but the left's also got his own share of kooks who can do the same thing. And I expected that the attacks when they came would come on, on Kevin McCarthy or Steve Scalise. Well, instead, they chose to threaten Darren Bailey. And I would say simply that if he's complaining about attack ads, well, what about the attack ads that, Mr. that Senator Bailey has also been running? And for that, not just his own, but also those ads that have been put together by that pack that Ted Line runs. And which have been essentially doing the same thing. 
We once had a great president in this country by the name of Harry Truman. And as President Truman once said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And that's what I would say. And um, they, they have been complaining for, for some time. The people on the right have been clamoring for a civil war. And guess what, guys? The civil war seems to be here, regardless of whether we want it or not. Finally, I would also like to say something else, and this is against my better judgment. I have long criticized the nuclear power industry for its shortcomings, and I continue to do so. And my support of it is against, frankly, my better judgment. But I've been forced to face the reality that in order to develop alternative sources of energy, like wind and solar power, we're going to need a crash effort like we made in the 1960s to put people on the moon. And I don't see that kind of an effort forthcoming. And at this point, we are confronted with the reality of a sick and dying planet. And we're running out of time to deal with this problem. And we may have to deal with nuclear power to use it, excuse me, the stock gap until we can get going and get that crash program going to develop wind and solar power. Which is not why I now agree with Tim about molten salt thorium reactors. <laughs> so Ooh. there you have it. Is there, any, is there anything that the Keys can actually come out that way? Me, pardon? Is there anything to remove an accident if you're going to be running all the things to stop an accident from happening? I repeat what I said before. I have the same criticism of the nuclear power industry that I did before. And that's going to have to be tough enough to crash down. <laughs> oh, you'll just unionize them, Charlie. It'll go great. Uh, and uh, I would also say, with all due respect to our libertarian friends, that I'm an old time Cook County Democrat. And you betcha when I voted on Thursday, I voted a straight Democratic ticket. And then I voted in favor of the, of the, um, of the um, workers' rights amendment, and also the proposition to increase the forest preserve property tax, because I'm convinced that desperately needed, not only to take care of pension obligations, but also to deal with a whole lot of deferred maintenance on forest preserve district buildings, forest preserve district streets, and to buy more land for the forest preserves. We all discovered during the pandemic that the forest preserves are a great place to go, Plus, they plus all those trees are useful as a carbon stick. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder for those who just recently checked in on Zoom, we have been going for about an hour, and we are at our first uh, hybrid meeting. We do have a guy from the UK. His name is Kelvin Manchet. If you want to show yourself, Kelvin, uh, we'd like to see you. And uh, if you have any comments on the uh, British Prime Minister, we'd entertain him at this point. Well, he's he's there, but uh, he's not unmuted. And I know that Jake is also going. Andy, if you want to say a few things for a few couple minutes, well, no, he's he's there. He's there. I just showed non-video participants right now on the main screen. All right, Andy, the floor is yours for a few minutes. Go ahead. Well, um, many people may not be familiar with Tom Hartman, but I think a lot of people are familiar with Ralph Nader and his history of working for justice and fairness and decency and things that help the American people. Is there any anybody people on this audience that doesn't know who Ralph Nader is and what is his history? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody familiar with Ralph Nader and his yeah. lifelong work to try to make things better for Americans? Yeah. Well, Ralph Nader no. just recently published an article a couple of days ago that said he ran on the Green Party. You know, he's been part of the Libertarian Party. Uh, you know, he was voting for uh, alternatives to Democrats and Republicans. He said, we have to recognize now that the Republican Party is not the Republican Party. It's a death call. You have to have criminal tendencies to run in a primary in the Republican Party. The Republican, the central party, 
central apparatus will vote you out and run a criminal in your place to do their bidding. The Republican Party has been weeding out anybody with ethics, morals, or a conscience <clears throat> since 1980 and Ronald Reagan. And it was morning in America with St. Ronald Reagan. They've been packing the courts with right-wing judges, actually politicians, groomed by the Federal Society to masquerading as judges. And we see this in our Supreme Court. You've got six basic criminal types masquerading as judges on the Supreme Court. And they're, they're working with, for those of you that don't know or never studied it, nothing illegal happened to the Jewish and uh, other people, Polish people, gypsies. Nothing illegal happened to those people in Germany during World War II. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. One bullet at a time. Let me finish. That, they passed laws making it legal. I didn't say it wasn't huge crimes against your man. Huh. I'm saying people made it all the way to the Nuremberg trial saying, I was just a good uh, politician or a good public huh. service in following. Yeah, I know. You were, I know. You were, you're only following <laughs> orders. It doesn't make it legal. Outside of our conversations, Jake, they we're made trying it to. Legal. And, and today, he's got the floor. Today, the Supreme Court is passing laws make in other courts too making it legal to let people die or kill people a variety of things that's one thing they're back in the courts number two yep. ralph said tom hartman a recent article about two days ago talked about the party and it's become a death cult it's no longer a political party and ralph said the only vote that makes any sense at all is to vote straight Democrat all the way on down the line. Don't split your vote. We have to try to smash the Republican side at the polls everywhere we can. Because if that death cult is not defeated, if they take over the Senate and the House, they're going to try to get rid of their, their, their plan. Their platform is destroy everything that Ralph and other environmentalists, universal people, uh, universal justice, human rights, the Republican Party's platform is to roll back everything going back to the 50 to 100 years. They want to get rid of Social Security. They want to get rid of the APA altogether. Just let corporations pollute everywhere. You know, think Flint, Michigan, lead in the water. Think Aaron Brockovich, the movie where they, uh, they were dumping chemicals in uh, poor neighborhoods. That's the corporate vision for America. I was growing up we were taught way early on, actions speak louder than words. Forget the rhetoric. What, what are big corporations telling you? Well, the medical industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industry has a very, very clear message from the billionaires that own and operate the pharmaceutical companies. Their message is, we're very sorry you're dying because you can't afford the medicine, but we need our billions. We're very sorry you can't afford to have an operation, but letting you die is more profitable than paying the insurance claims uh, to help you get on with a decent life. We have people all across the spectrum. The oil companies say, well, we're very sorry we're polluting all the rivers and uh, wetlands around uh, the oil processing. They're going, we're sorry about that. But if we clean that up and we cut into our billions, then like one one family a few years back, one of the owners of Walmart was quoted. They asked him, "How much money? How much money do you need for your family?" And he said, "Well, I got two kids to put through college, and my wife likes to shop. And she likes nice things. So my family isn't secure yet. I only got twenty-two billion in the bank. Picture that. That's that's not greed. That's a psychopathic mental illness." And that, that's, what, that's what we have. We have cycle we, with this country. The political system is made up of billionaire predator pimps at the top, owning and operating the state <laughs> of intellectual prostitutes masquerading as our senators and congressmen. That's the bottom line. And if you have people that don't realize that, they might as well be wearing a sign that says, Look at me, I'm dumber than a fifth grader, and I'm damn proud of it. <laughs> I don't tolerate it. <clears throat> I should have brought a sign up, but around with three feet around me now is a zone where we don't tolerate cribs. That's cribs is short for criminally insane bullshit. 
we're way past the point where we can tolerate cribs in the middle of Republicans running for office saying, uh, well, if you're a Democrat and you voted for a cleaner environment, you deserve the death penalty. Who said that? There's Marjorie Taylor Greene and some of the others who are talking about Democrats that deserve the death penalty. Nancy Pelosi and some of the others. These people, really, they deserve to be executed. If you don't know these things that are being broadcast nationwide on the right-wing network, then you're not up to date. You're simply incredibly uninformed about what's going on. And this incredible ignorance is snowballing down. 75 million Americans, a quarter of the country, are living in a cult, that's what we call it, the MAGA cult, the cult of Trump, where they believe things that aren't real. And these, these false beliefs have been pushed on the websites. Um, you know, 25 years ago, there was no Google, there was no uh, TikTok, all these others. And now we're finding out the social media has been promoting these false corrosive ideas that have brought people right to the point. I, I, I know some people in, in my customer base, there's a handful that uh, have people, uh, friends that go to churches that say, they're teaching that Donald Trump was sent by God to lead us out of the darkness. <laughs> Picture that. Now, and when I had an argument, it wasn't an argument, I just backed off. I said, I felt so bad. Here's a person that is like talking to a Hare Krishna. You know, you, you, can't, you can't get anywhere because they're in, they're in a mind-bending cult. This woman believed that Donald Trump has done more good things for America than any president we ever had. Whereas Donald Trump ran the greatest crime spree, crime spree we've seen since Bush Cheney in 2000 to 2008. I thought that was the greatest crime spree in history <clears throat> up until Donald Trump started pulling every key position to, to run our government. Look at what, what's his face did to the post office. Wanted to privatize the post office and get rid of one of the most popular public programs in history. So, Louis DeJoy and, uh, you know, the head of the EPA, uh, an oil company executive. You know, pick, just picture every, every major post was appointed by Trump. Three people had criminal tendencies going way back. And that's where we are. So if you want to see a change, if you don't want to see the country go down the tube, like Ernie talked about. Uh, and then one final thing. Tom Hartman's been writing about it for years. He's been talking about it the last two weeks. When we have a Republican party in office, the suicide rate goes up, the death rate goes up, the death rate from all across the you know, people die at an earlier age. When the Democrats are in office, things get better. That's going back 60 years, you can look it up. So if you care about America, both Democratic, straight, this one time, hold your nose, forget about the Libertarians, forget about anybody else, and vote a straight Democratic ticket on Tuesday if you haven't already voted. Thank you. All right. All right. Will there be questions or is this yeah, there'll be questions? We're gonna put I'm gonna put two more speakers on real quick. And then we're gonna go to okay, Kelvin, can you hear us? Yes, I okay. I went out and came back in. Right, Kelvin, hang on, let me get the sound up. Uh we would like to invite you to speak for about uh you know four or five minutes and then we'll get it. I'm gonna get the mic. I've got nothing prepared, but I'll I'll give it a go. Yeah, come on. When you're ready, go ahead. What now? Uh, you're there, Calvin. Go ahead. Get done. Get started. Oh, God, you put me on the spotlight on you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I normally, I'm normally a counterpuncher for crying out loud. All right. Okay. Um, I'd like to know. I. This is this is Chicago, right? I live in Chicago. Um, a lot of it's to do with internal politics, but I'd like to know. I, from what I get from American politics is you're very, very divided at the moment. I mean, really very divided. Um, I want to know what Republicans would not accept from Trump, what Trumpers would not accept from Trump, uh, what, would, what would make them jump off the bandwagon. I'd like to know what... You know, you know, what ideas for coming together here? And is is a is a conflict inevitable in America? It's it, uh, as I think something like at least 
think 10% of America, Americans, think, on both sides of the political divide, think that it's inevitable. Um, all right, uh, if you can hear some bangs and um, explosions outside, not quite at the moment, but uh, it's because it's November the 5th in, uh, in, in, in Britain. I said what was it is, yeah, as well. Um, but it's, when, it's a night when we celebrate the, um, the torture and execution of a fundamentalist terrorist. And, uh, well, that's one side of it. The other one is, it was a case of, it was a false flag operation and uh, entrapment. But anyway, yeah, there's one which is, uh, by the way, it's going on outside. Happy Guy Fox Day, Kelvin. All, All right. right. What would you say? Happy Fox Day? Happy Guy Fox Day. Happy no, Guy we don't, Fox don't say happy, happy, we don't say happy Guy Fox Day. We just say, probably let me say, woo, you say, woo, look at the fireworks. <laughs> um, there is a note, it's not like Halloween or, you know, or Easter or it's, uh, it's quirky in British. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Kelvin. I'm going to get our next speaker up. All right, uh, Ellen Corley, please take the uh, microphone stand and uh, um, just wait, keep it brief, please. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Tim. And uh, yeah, it's good to be back here. I'm Ellen Corley. And um, yeah, I, uh, I believe in this free speech forum and uh, I believe in the College of Complexes and uh, to clarify things, I um, I appreciate you know Charlie's uh, leadership here to an extent. I I did uh, you know I wanted us to be back in in person, and I wanted us to have equal access to the ballot or to the opportunity to speak. I got censored twice, uh, and really haven't been on the um, ballot. Maybe it was miscommunication, but. Uh, about critical issues. And I, I think that's the most important thing to saving democracy now is it's about knowledge and um, the process of democracy here in our classroom. I studied, I got a master's in teaching and education and a master's in business and management and uh, you know studied social work. And what I believe in is the process, you know, we need to educate each other. It needs to be a mutual self-help. I also have what, 22 years in AA, which is the best curriculum of all, where it's a mutual self-help process. We, you know, it's it's got to be equal. If people don't know, I should give a talk on, on the history of AA uh, going back, what, 1936 or something, but uh, it was, started by two guys, but it, it really broke off from the Oxford group. And Oxford group became fascism and AA has managed to employ the most democratic management, you know, human resources, organizational development norms, culture norms in the world. It, it's really a miracle because one, there's only the management changes every 12 weeks and there's a culture of service a culture of love and tolerance, of mutual self-help, of you know, sponsorship. And we need that here now because it really did, in the 30s, it became literally fascism. And this is a history that is not known. And that's really become the topic that I, I want to talk about more. And maybe if I presented it, Charlie would allow me to do it. But I, this, Fascism, you know, I've looked at policing. You look at, at dangerous medicine, you know, vaccines as, as, you know, to poison off people. Uh, you know, the this came from the Nazis and they got it from actually from us before that, from, you know, the uh, this, it, Luciferian cult eugenics. There was a, really a philosophy in the 30s, even Eleanor Roosevelt went along, Lindbergh, all these people that we don't know were, uh, you know, eugenics was seen as necessary. And uh, we we just think that it's like we've got sugar-coated, you know, um, Sunday school as history that, 
but this history, we have to see evil. And really, the only thing that explains it is Luciferian, but, but they're getting away with it. It goes back, you know, these 30s, after World War II, the, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the OSS, these were formed by Alan Dulles and um, John Foster Dulles. And, you know, with the National Security Law, Law National Security Act of 1947. And, but Truman, you know, a good guy, he didn't realize that they put in there covert operations, that we would, they'd be violating every principle, every law, every constitution, every amendment, every, you know, stated practice and go around and put in puppet governments like in Iran and with a, with a Nazi, the view of bringing back the Fourth Reich. This is not, you know, speculation. This is documented proof. This happened, they found the bill, this through NATO, Gladio, the Team D, and but because it's called revisionist, it goes back to revisionist Zionism, revisionism. Okay, um, you know, we revision, they cover it up with our with knowledge. They control the media, the knowledge, the history, the way it's written down through, I discovered this prosecutor management information system, but through the CIA and the Justice Department corrupt, it really got on steroids with 1980, the Reagan election. Um, I think this is why I, Andy is right. The Republican Party is a cult because they, you know, they stole the election by sabotaging what they called the October surprise. They, enemies and, um, you know, this dirty politics, working with FBI, working with you know, um, just the worst people. We everybody agrees these people are terrible, but they what we don't realize is it's worked now, and it, they've almost taken over. You know, it, they're they're right, they're there. We you know we we it's probably too late. That's the worst thing. It's too late, really, for the planet. Okay, you know, but uh, it, it shouldn't be too late for us to agree on what's going on, and that's why I see I you know, so passionate about free speech. And, you know, so Charlie says, Ellen, go speak in the street, go somewhere else. Well, we, it's, it starts with the culture. And, you know, I was thinking, what is, what's missing here? What can I do? It's me. It's my right, my right to be here, my right to be heard, my right to be on the ballot. You know, we don't talk about that. Oh, go out and vote. I was on the ballot and they said, Charlie and the Green Party, a small group, put me up for 10 years. Well, I was, I was on the Green Party. And then I, there was a 10 page document and they said, oh, she's got offensive speech. She's anti-Semitic. Um, there's nothing anti-Semitic about me. I did say that no, we cannot save the planet. We cannot stop the violence. We cannot have education, health, welfare, rights, women's rights, right to vote. It's human rights, unless we can get the truth. And that we, you know, you can't have dirty, underhanded abuse of power by a secret police state. And that, if, if Charlie, he told me five years ago, are you in the FBI? I said, no, he goes, I am. I, you know, so I, I, he's never denied it. He just keeps avoiding it. It's not a joke. I mean, he's, they, this is a pattern. 2,000, you know, infiltrators into the left-wing organization. These are the books I have called Intelligence Activities and the Rights of People. They infiltrate left-wing organizations and, you know, the Black Panthers, okay, the American Indian Movement, you know, um, you name it. We have been infiltrated and it's done at the party level. This is why if we're gonna have a reform, we gotta get rid of parties because look at the independents. It used to be 40% of people are independent and then you've got 30 Democrats, 30 Republicans. Now, what is the chance of the independent getting on the ballot? Zero, you know, we've got to look at the process, right? Without billions of dollars and Citizens United of corrupt, dirty money, we're all gonna lose. That's it. Thank you. All right. Okay.
Yeah. Now we will go into our question and answer period. I'd like each and everybody who has a question, I'd like Justin to come up first to answer questions and then we'll go on and maybe each of our speakers, if they have something, uh, we can go into it, then we'll go into our rebuttals. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll try to keep the question and answer period at about eight to nine minutes or thereabouts. But okay. uh, if you have questions for Justin, please go ahead. I got a uh, ticket, but uh, mm -hmm. I didn't buy one for me, I got one for you. I, I forgot it when I, I have to go to question Why do you kiss me? Oh, no, on Amendment 1, and, and why? because uh, we feel that uh, it would, in a state where labor unions already have a lot of power and they're often corrupt organizations working with corrupt, corrupt people in the government, that it's not, a, excuse me, a good idea. Um, and then the second one was raising taxes on for the park district. No, we vote no on that one too because because uh, because we already pay for a lot of things. We can you know we don't need to raise taxes for park stuff. Uh, well, people like parks; they can pay. You know, people can pass the hat for the parks, and they'd be okay. Have the government pass the hat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Let me just follow up. Go ahead, but uh, if, if you're going to do so, uh, um, Justin, if you because the sound isn't coming through. Sure, I'll repeat questions. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up with the actual amendment. I don't know the question. Uh, I mean, when the amendment passes, then they won't be able to pass the right to the law. Even in the public sector, yeah, they won't be able to pass the right to the law. All right, uh, we got another question down here. Yeah, I uh, I went somewhere, but. I've heard that too, yes. Is that correct? Okay, that, that, that Amendment 1 only covers government work. Okay, okay that the National Labor Law covers. Is that right? I've heard that too, but I don't know if I don't understand. Okay. Federal employees are covered under federal law. Oh, so this applies to state workers? Yeah. Also, okay. Applies to what? State workers. The right to work laws are covered under federal law. I would think so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, repeat the question. Uh, so he asked uh, what I thought about the quote, taxes are the price one pays for a civilized society. Uh, I mean, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, it's excessive taxation. Is, is the logic that the more taxes you pay, then the better your society is? Exactly. So, um, I mean, there's some things that taxes are okay to be used for, but you can also tax people too much, and it uh, then that money gets wasted, and people could then could have spent that money for their own purposes, and it's theirs. Maybe people want to talk about greed. You know, it's not greedy to want to keep your own money. It's certainly greedy to want to take other people's money. Yes, uh, Andy. Am I familiar with the history of unions in the last 80 years? Okay. 
main job was every major advancement had to get a plot for the plot for this one. So the question is, is that true? I don't know if that's true or not. What? It's it's tough. That's what I'm saying. We don't know that it's true. It's I thought true. this was a question. It, it, it is. Yeah, yeah, I said I'm familiar. Yeah. It's clear that it's more understandable about the speech you gave me. You're unfamiliar with the history. No, I'm familiar with it. Like eight hour day? Or against the eight hour day or when did I say I was against the eight hour day? I don't know. That, I mean, that's how we got. The I eight mean, hour day. most employer would employer would employers make people work more than eight hour days? There wasn't uh, laws uh, uh, stopping them from doing that. Yeah, yeah, they would. Uh, uh, you could, but you can already work more than eight hours now. So, well, you get paid well, more. Okay. Um, I have a question. Kelvin's got a question, so hold on. Okay, have you, uh, have, are you aware of Margaret Mead's answer to when civilization started? Who? Well, she was an anthropologist, so an archaeologist. And she said, it's when we discovered a human bone that had a broken leg that had healed. That meant the people in that tribe and taking time out to look after this individual until it was better, until he, or he was better, right? That means that that's what we are as a civilization when we look after each other. Now, taxation is one way for us to look after each other. What's your question? Okay, I, I'm, are, you aware, are you aware of that, 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 that idea? Am I worried that tech? I, people can will take care of other people. They don't need, you know, taxes to pay taxes to care for other people. There's no virtue in helping people if, if you're coerced into doing it. Um, it. You know, people will help people regardless of their. Well, well, what if what if you like helping people not. and you're paid to do it? What if you're a, a mental health worker? What if you're a, a social worker? What if you're a policeman? Your job is to prevent crime. It's not to not not, not it's not it's uh, protect and serve, and prevent crime is one of the things. You know, you're not there to catch criminals. Ideally, you're there to prevent crime. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so I guess obviously I'm for paying less taxes. So that just means I'm for for more crime and for more. You know. You know. Just poor people, people, poor people steal. Less people. I, you, yeah, let me I tell, let me tell you, what, let me tell you, what, the you got no money, and you got no, and you got you nothing. Really Don't steal. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I read the libertarian position that if the employees get together, hold a democratic election, and elect to have a union. That the Libertarian Party maintains that an individual employee is disqualified himself and say, I'm not going to join it. Now, you tell me. Is that your question? Where in the world you're familiar with how democracy works with majority plus one? What's your question? <laughs> that an individual, however the vote is taken, oh, even within your party, can say, I have the right to veto or nullify nullification of the results. If a, if a What's your question? If a democratic vote is taken, why do you maintain that you an individual to nullify the results? All right, so I think you have the can you have the uh, position incorrect. The the, the platform lp.org slash platform I think it says that you can you know people <coughs> Groups of people can enter into agreements, and you know, and if, if people are going to enter, you know, if you if somebody's going to approach you and make an offer, you have the right to refuse that offer or the right to not enter in that agreement. That is what the Libertarian Party position is. 
Um, so if I own a restaurant, let's say I own Dapper's East, and all my uh, one pool at a time, Charlie, 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 one pool at a time. Let him make his point. So, um, so if if I if I run uh, Dapper's East and all the employees come up to me and say we voted to form a union, yeah, I can as the owner of the place I should be able to say no or Why? yes. Why? Because I own the business and in the the workers do not. So they have no right to organize. No, they were they have a right to organize and they did and they came to me and I just uh, did not accept their offer. So I'm not okay, not accepting that. their offer is not a denial of their right to organize or their right to uh, try to form a union I, they, or they ex certainly exercise that right. Me so or any party uh, right not union. entering into a contract with a union is not the same as saying that you're yeah. anti. Good, good luck on your restaurant with the picket line out, out the side of it. Slavery. No, that's slavery. It's no, slavery. It's the right. So if, if the if the if they vote to form a union, then what they they just because they vote that means they own my property now, or they yeah, just because the they voted yes they can run. Yeah, bargain. So they have to make a bargain with the with the shop owner, and yeah. if the shop owner refuses the bargain, he has that right to do so as the owner of the shop. Yeah, I mean Charlie would never allow a, a college of complexes union ever. So I mean, I, if we came up to him and say, "Hey, we're forming a union, and this is these are the terms," and you refuse. Is I mean you would refuse it in a minute. So I mean, no employee, no employee. We could form a subcommittee to change the rules. I move, I move to form a union of college of complexes students uh, to um, represent our interest um, and co collectively bargain with the program director. All in favor of forming a union, say aye. It looks like it looks like the majority of the people in this room uh, just voted to form this union. So Charlie, you you uh, do you are you going to enter an agreement with us? I'm not being silly, Charlie. I'm I'm, I'm going. You you these are the places you set up. You sit, you sit down. I'm not sitting down. All right. We've been warned about the sound. I have okay. to turn it down a little. All right. Next up. All right. Ernie, Thanks, go ahead. Yeah, Ernie, Ernie, it's your turn. Call for questions now. Oh, <laughs> your, your turn, Ernie. <laughs> well, <laughs> we got several. That was too good. All right. <laughs> well, all right, questions for Ernie. Yeah, the owner of the company can say, I don't care what you do. Okay. All right. Remember, repeat the question, Ernie. Does uh I have a call, I have a question. Okay, Dan, Dan's got a question first. Does the state of Illinois need a treasurer and a controller? Why can't one person do the checks and the treasury? Are you talking about state government? I think there's yeah. a lot of sympathy for that, but there's a lot of sympathy the other way, and I don't know the specific ins and outs. Okay, thank you. Okay. First of all, my name's Mike Farrell. I've just been introduced by this lady and Ellen, and I decided to sit here. But Aaron Johns, first of all, the world would be a better place without one job, is my opinion. Uh, and uh, secondly, your arguments with Come here. your arguments with fabulous. Do you support the NRA? All right, it's interesting you should bring up the NRA because I have a good friend. Some of you know uh, Greg Hudson, who used to come to the College of Complexes. 
Uh, he's a very, very anti-gun fellow. But in the 60s and into the 70s, he was a member of the NRA. Because till about, I think he says around 1973, the NRA was a sportsman's organization for people who went hunting and so on and so forth. And uh, it, was, it was totally different than it is now. And then sometime during that early 70s period, some folks got in and turned it into a political uh, pro-gun, possibly was uh, excessive influence by the gun manufacturers. And as a result, now the NRA is, is basically uh, an organization that uh, they claim to support the Second Amendment, but basically what they want to do is, is uh, uh, support the gun industry. That's, that's what uh, a lot so of- So I take that as a no. Um, Yes and no. I think that the, 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 the gun industry has a right to a lobby, the same as the automobile industry or the aircraft industry or, or any other industry. Uh, but there's a special situation there. They're, they're, uh, they're getting into the politics a little too much, in my opinion. There, there needs to be an organization, and there needs to be... I know there are gun sports organizations. I don't know. I'm not a gun sportsman. Well, you know, for example, uh, I have asked this question of a lot of people. What possible use is there for a 20 bullet point? I know. Is it all? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Give it to us. When, when uh, the government comes to me. <laughs> okay. okay. Aside from that, aside from that, so that everything else is collateral damage. Leading into when the government comes. That's collateral. Well, most people who have guns don't use them. Yeah, I appreciate it. As he mentioned, yeah, I, I, I a lot of what his, uh, his uh, presentation. I disagree with some things. But... 30,000 30, deaths. I appreciate that. But aside from when the government comes from, everything else is collateral damage. Waiting for that to happen. So that, that's. Well, that's, okay. So there's, 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 there's a whole bunch of. Uh, side issues to what you're bringing up here, Mike, uh, as far as what, what use are guns. If, if nobody had any guns at all, uh, there'd be some validity to the argument. But the fact is, as soon as you have some people who have guns, you have some people who are going to abuse them. And therefore, and sometimes the only way to keep these people under control at least a little bit is with guns so, so in the hands of policemen. That's the, that's the University of Chicago guy's argument that more guns uh, is, is makes everything a lot safer. Well, and, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, so you have to figure out how many guns make is the is the divide fighting because we start with zero guns. Yeah. Is okay. a lot safer than anything. Zero guns. I, I, I so, disagree. So that, okay, go ahead. Finish your question. Okay. No, I'll, I want to hear a rebuttal, but zero guns is a lot safer. Okay, zero guns is a lot safer. Uh, it, then you're a lot safer from being hurt or dying by guns if there are no guns. But that doesn't mean there won't be crime or, or other situations uh, on, a, on a national, international, local level. Uh, there, you know, people for, for, for thousands of years. Uh, there were no guns, and there were still lots of people being slaughtered. Okay, one way or another. So, so can I? Can, can I? Can yeah. I, can I say all right. Uh, all right. Uh, and there, uh, and there, uh, okay. Hang on. Hang on. Wait a second. Kelvin's uh, next. Kelvin's uh, next. Kelvin's next. Uh, uh, Kelvin's from a society has very few guns. Okay. Yeah. They, yes, they are available, uh, but mostly the the penalties for owning a, uh, a gun, which would be illegal, um, are so high. But really, only very high end criminals and one or two kind of like wannabes have under their floorboards. It, right. the, the, the gun crime is compared to America and, and a lot of other places, it's very, very minimal. We had a, a, a an awful shooting in, in Liverpool uh, last month, and it was headline news in the in the local papers for weeks and weeks afterwards. Unfortunately, a, a young child was was killed. But it was only two people. Two people were shot, which doesn't make it a mass shooting. Okay, Kel uh, Kelvin, wait, a minute, wait a minute. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that 
I've been, you know, yes, there's crime. And I've talked to a lot of guys about this. And we've had a few beers and I said, if we had guns in this in our society, there's at least been about four or five times that each and every one of us have been in where somebody would have got shot. Okay. When you've got guns in the society, you're always taking that risk. Okay. It's like okay. it's like it's like owning a car and, and drinking all the time. You've okay. always you know it's not it's not good. Can you recap right. that so that we yeah, can yeah, hear it? that? Uh, all right, basically uh Kelvin, um, they're, they're having a little trouble hearing you here at some point. I think, uh, you know, our, 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 this, 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 the volume on the speakers is a little low here in the, uh, the computer. All right, sorry. Uh, maybe I was talking, yeah, I'm used to talking. I, I'm not yeah, used to that, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit metallic, but we're going to, we're going to, he's asking you, uh, basically, there was a shooting last week in the thing, and he's asking if there are ways to have zero guns in the society. Well, I, I, I don't think that's certainly not possible now. I'm not even sure it's desirable. I do know that in the UK there, there are very, very few guns. I've talked to several people I've run into from UK and they, they are, you know, they scoff at our crime rate here and they say the reason is- we don't do, you know, do you know, do you know, do you know who the biggest advocate for not arming the police is? Do you know who the biggest advocate of not arming the police is? Uh, they yeah. call I know that that the, that the uh, what do you call the it? police did not used to have guns. The, the police, the police, are the, the police have guns. The police have advocated not not to arm them. The you know, we still have armed police at airports and and, and security, you know, in certain security security places. But okay, um, and, and rapid response. All but right, the, but we don't. The, the police aren't armed, and the police want it that way because if they became up, become armed. Then you know the crimes are gonna get 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 armed. Okay, Kelvin. All right, let's go ahead. Let me. Uh, All right, Ellen's next. Ellen. Okay. All right, Ellen. So I wanted to get your opinion about those statewide referendum questions on the ballot. The oh, on the ballot. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I don't know uh, anything about the. Uh, uh, Fourth Reserve, but I probably would be in favor of it. Uh, because well, I, I mean, you might want to figure out what you think about it because the election's going to be a tough day. I, I know. And, and well, see, 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 unlike Justin, who believes that, that taxation is theft, I think in, in many cases, uh, who was it? Who was it that said uh, that the price of uh, society is, is paying taxes? I do not object to taxes that go for a good purpose. And I think, generally speaking, a forest preserve or a park is, is good purpose. And um, as far as the other amendment, I, I, I uh, intend to vote for it. Uh, I don't know as much about it as I would like, but I believe uh, in unions and the right to unionize, and to the extent that this would uh, this would help. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I got a question. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah. What is my hypothesis? I wonder what you think of this is that the problem is the, the police say a, a secret, hidden, militarized growth of this police state and uh, our government, you know, putting another thousand more police, but also the what's happening evolving. Yeah, I'd like you to comment on the fact that what's happened with evolving that there were. What, 20, 40 police and standing the around question during the shooting? So, the I mean, question yeah, is. so the question is what role does a corrupt, you know, policing in America, you know, a fascist America have on it? Well, and first, the, first I, I do I do not agree that, that America is fascist at this point. Uh, we have serious problems in the police department, that is clear. And and we should work on them. I've I've known some police over the over the years who are good people, and of course there are some who are not. And we should we should uh, come down very hard on those that are that are not. Uh, as far as uh, Uvalde, um, I did, very sad situation for me. I just really burn when I see the pictures of the police you know, surrounding the place and, and <clears throat> running away when the guy fires one or two bullets. And, and I don't know how many people died, a dozen or 17 or whatever died in Uvalde while the police were there. Columbine was even worse 
years before. The police built a perimeter around the place and at least one teacher bled to death while they were deciding what to do. That's just so disgusting. Uh, those people should definitely not uh, be allowed to, to uh, be policemen. And, and unfortunately, there are probably more cases like that are gonna come up. There are other cases where the police are really brave and okay. they, do, they go in and they do what they're, what they're supposed to do. Um, and, but but your 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 going your allegation that there's problems in corruption in police department sure there are and uh, the the saddest thing I think is that in the police it's becoming kind of a a family thing it's becoming kind of a uh, an organization that is separate from society the policeman used to be your neighbor and and you used to know the police and trust the police. Uh, and now the police are becoming somewhat separate uh, from, from the rest of society, as is the military. The military used to be intertwined. In World War II, they said there was either somebody from your house or the house next door who was involved in the military. Everybody had, you know, uh, a relationship. When we lose, when we lose that close uh, connection with our military and with our police, I think we're in deep trouble. Uh, internally and externally. One, one, uh, first of all, like, like I said, and, and oh, go on, go on, whoever was. Okay, yeah, if I may. Um, so, thank you for your uh, presentation. Listening to some of your comments, something that I know I've thought about for a while is that there are, with all the discussion over magazine size, speed with which rounds can be fired, and that sort of thing. I think we're also maybe reaching a point where there will be new technologies that don't need to be manufactured in the factory where people will be able to kind of make them at home, sort of yeah. like the maybe maybe printing. 3D printing, or it'll be worse than the Saturday night special of yesteryear. And if we imagine a generation from now where it's a lot more than just bullets, if it was like, oh, you know, someone has a personal drone. I think that's Tim's toast. Uh, personal drone with explosives on them or something like that. Sure. Will there ever be a feasible way? This is something I put to both gun rights advocates and gun restriction advocates. Will there be a way to for any legal framework to keep up with this sort of bizarre frontiers of weapons technology and portable weapons technology and how that spreads into everyday hands and it won't just be armies and intelligence agencies that have, you know, the drone with the grenade launcher on it. Yeah, years. yeah I, okay, I guess, I guess there, there, there will always be a trade-off between freedom and risk. Uh, when you, when we as a society take the risk of allowing these weapons and these technologies to risk that they will be misused, that includes guns, it includes drones, it includes all kinds of things. People, you know, use gas cans and bottles with the gasoline in them as weapons. Uh, there, there'll always be a trade-off. The only way to completely end uh, danger from this type of thing to, to people in society is to clamp down so we have nothing resembling a free society. Uh, that could that could ultimately happen. Uh, I think the real danger comes not from the from the drones and the other types of technology. At some point in the future, technology will allow mind reading and mind control from central sources. And that's, that, that, that's very scary. That could come about. And what's scariest about it is it could be that a large, large number of people will, for the sake of security, they will support such things. And so there will always be this trade. I don't know where the balance is. Okay. Uh, okay. Charlie had a question. Charlie, Charlie, I got a question. I'm just curious. Why? You maintain that why do you maintain that instances of mass shootings, terribly tragic events involving sometimes unnamed people, are just media eyes? Uh, they're, they're not realize that human beings die in those situations. People die. I, I certainly realize that people die and, and, and media eyes. No, it's not just you no. Know, that what I'm saying is that certain types. Of, well, no, okay. I, tell me when you're going to stop. All right, it's a school shooting. Media hype. Uh, no, none of the media media hype follows 
the school shootings and the events in Las Vegas, you're referring, I think, to Las Vegas where all 50 people were killed. The media follows. Yes, as soon as something like that happens, the media jumps in. What I'm saying is that 20,000 or more people, 20, 22,000 people a year die from suicide from guns. But we, we hear about this occasionally, but not very much. But as soon as there's a school shooting, it's all- I have a question. I have a question. Okay, uh, hold on. I have a question. I have a question. Hang on, Calvin. Okay. Oh, it's gonna be, we got one more questioner after you. Go ahead, Calvin. Um, do you not think that uh, guns are um, a contributory factor to, the, to those suicides? Uh, I, what I'm talking about is it, it's, a, it's an enabler, it's a, it's a ways and means. Now, I'm not saying if, you're, if you want to commit suicide, you'll find a way. If you're locked in a solitary confinement cell, you'll find some way, right? Okay, we've got you. Okay, but, but a lot, a lot of suicides, a lot, of, it's a lot of suicides. Uh, they're, they're spare at the moment. They're whatever. If someone takes pills, solicitors, whatever. It's a, but you know, well, you know, you, if you really want to do it, you go and find a, a tall building and jump off it, or, or a train, or something like that. But that means going out. Okay, Kelvin. Now, yeah, no, Kelvin, when you've got a, no, when you've got that, when you've got that gun on the shelf. It's a lot easier to just pick it up and put it in your mouth. So okay. Do you not think the availability of guns might be a contributing factor to that 20,000 suicide? Okay, Kelvin, we got to cut it off at this point. We're going to let Ernie answer, and then I got one more questioner after this, and we got to go to rebuttals. Okay, I'm going to answer Charlie first because he, he never, never got an answer to his question. Uh, what I'm saying is that, that, that in people's minds, mass shootings are a bigger problem than, uh, for example, the gangland shootings in Chicago or, or, or suicides, for example, or automobile deaths, which are similar in, in number. We, we don't, we talk about them some, we hear about them on the news a little, but I think in people's minds, these items are bigger. And that's just one of the points I was trying to make. I'm not saying they're not serious, and I'm not saying that the vi victims uh, uh, you know, aren't suffering from this, but it's it's just that there's a, a disproportionate amount of press coverage to certain types of violence as opposed to other types of violence, and and we should look at it more more objectively. Last um, question. First of all, I hate, like I said, I hate guns, but you had a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, interweaving of solutions or toning down. Uh, essentially the NRA uh, with background checks and with, uh, you know, the 25-year-olds. Yeah. I mean, it's not even in the realm of possibility in the NRA in that something like that happen. Sure. So, sure. so, uh, uh, so I love that. And I, guns would not be a big problem. But uh, just, a, just a statement is... Oh, no. the What's United, your question? United, yeah, Question, period. Yeah, rebuttals are coming up. Right? You'll be able to come up with regarding, regarding school shootings. You know, the United States has five times more school shootings yeah. than the rest of the civilized world combined. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Okay. But 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 the again why? what I'm why? saying, well, what I'm saying is well, why? Because because uh that, that's a much more complicated way. That's can't be answered in three minutes. Well, I think I, I have some thoughts on that, but they, but there's no way of okay. covering them in that in that time period. And and again, it's a, it's a thing of perception. I don't think Kelvin got any good answers to his question, but maybe he'll give a rebuttal. Right. We'll okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. We're now up. We're now up for rebuttals. We're going to do the in-person ones first. Two chairs up here. Three minutes apiece. Come on up. Start rebutting. You guys know the routine with the uh, musical chairs. So, uh, who wants to go first? Mike's microphone's open. Three minutes for a rebuttal. And uh, let's get started. So, uh, whoever wants to go first, sit down up here because you're going to be recorded. I need you at the microphone for your rebuttal. Okay. Uh, uh, three minutes, everybody. So, let's get started on these rebuttals. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, hi. I just um, regarding rebuttals. I 
part of this forum is that we, you know, you can just kind of comment. And um, I, but I do uh, think, I think the problem is deeper than the public level. And so that's why I think we've got a problem with parties. I think the process is not, <laughs> uh, it, it seems to just be, uh, there's more uh, you know, libertarian. I agree with the philosophy. I've agreed with all the different parties, but it doesn't matter because the system is structurally corrupt. And um, until we can figure out, you know, we need, but one, there's a criminality to the Republicans. So they should be put in jail. But key thing is one, executive order 12333 is, you know, said, agreed they would not, the CIA Justice Department will not investigate themselves. It's called the unitary executive power. This was Hitler's and the Third Reich's jurist theory of Carl Schmidt that was brought over here by Leo Strauss. They agree, they think they have, you know, the president can't be prosecuted. That, you know, so he can be basically a mafia don. And so we've got, you know, dueling mafia. It's neo-feudalism, um, neo-fascism. And that's what we've got. And, uh, but it's invisible. They've got a great way by controlling the media. You, you know, you don't know. And I think that's why the guns are the way they are. And the police state is a surface of it, you know, that, false flags. You know, 9-11, guys, was an inside job. I got up in front of the police board and I said, how many of you know it? Lori Lightfoot and the rest of them stand there like you're talking to the, you know, the Sibazi or the Gestapo. And you realize the way, you know, Charlie said, why don't, why aren't I teaching anymore? Well, you think the Nazi state, a, a you know, whistleblower or a, an honest Democrat is going to keep a job? No. They are the ones that are, you know, sent to the gas chambers. It wasn't just the Jews. It was anybody who dared question the totalitarian system, right? It was the communist Jews. It was the communist Romans, the communist gays, the communist, you know, and that's how we taught the blacks and the browns. I have gathered so much power and understanding by really putting myself in the shoes of my friends, the John Burge torture survivors. That's what really put me over the edge with Charlie, because we've already given that topic. Have we given a topic on the John Burge torture survivors? Wouldn't you be interested in knowing they're my friends? What's going to happen on Monday? One guy has, he was going to start a free school to help the 30% of the people in prisons now are innocent. They had to take a plea deal because our criminal justice system is so corrupt. You know, and the read yeah. one book, they, it's an, actually a law, Executive Order 12333, that they will not investigate the CIA, the leading bringing in drugs. <clears throat> they brought in the whole, we fought Vietnam so that we could bring in opium to the United States. The crack wars, you know, were brought to the United States. The investigative journalist that exposes that is murder, Gary Webb. And also because he was writing about Executive Order 12333. But then the legal system changes the words. They are so corrupt. They removed honest services laws. They pushed all this, this criminal justice to the states. And so they basically are dismantling. This was the theory of the Supreme Court, the federal government. Okay, your you know, time's... we are not told that we all are right. basically, and we can prove it. Okay, and um, all right. Thank you very much. Our next rebutter, please. Well, who's our next rebuttal? Why don't you go ahead and give a few words if you want to rebut? You got three minutes. Three minutes to say your piece. I think I said what I wanted to say. Use the mic. Use the mic. I said what I wanted to say about guns, really. But I also, there was another kind of issue that was kind of peripherally mentioned. And that's, well, unions were true. Peripherally mentioned, they were directly mentioned, but uh, uh, we fought. Uh, there was discussion, both straight democratic and uh, and uh, to summarize or to the point I want to uh, talk about is why is the state of Illinois bankrupt, the county of Cook bankrupt? and the city of Chicago bankrupt. Uh, 
Democrats have been in power in all of them. The, the, the last two forever. And the, the state of Illinois more often than not over the last uh, 25 years. And, and listen, I, I believe in you, but I do not believe in government unions. Uh, uh, I, believe, I believe that governments, for the most part, are going to treat people fair. For the most part, schools, for example, teachers have a gun to the head of politicians. They say, if we don't get what we want, we will go on strike. And God forbid that a child is out of school two months or whatever it takes to, uh, to break, not break the union, but to see the union have some sense which at least, in my opinion, the school union, the firemen's union, and the policemen's unions, do they, the three of them have guns to the politicians' heads. You realize, of course, that one, one bullet time, strike. Charlie. Uh, one bullet time. Okay. You Thank you very time. much. Thanks, what am I aware? Let's get an extra butter what, up there, what please. Mike, walk out. What's up? Let, let All right. Yeah, thank, hey, thank you for coming. To, okay, John. David Zucker, you're next. Yeah, welcome back. Okay, David, you're next there. Let me get the camera lowered a little bit here so they can see you. Okay, go ahead. First of all, I would like to say that my mother was a school teacher and that she was an active and an enthusiastic member of the Chicago Teachers Union. And the union was how my mom put got the salary and benefits that she needed to put food on the table for the three of us. So I'm sorry. And the, the, uh, the opposition to government unions is horseshit, plain and simple. <laughs> but I happen to admire Franklin Roosevelt. I think he's a great he president. Said, he said, he, he interned Japanese people. He and, said, he said and I would also he say, hey, one, one fool at a time. Okay. I would, I would also say the following that the police and I don't always agree with the police any more than you do but I would also say that the police have one of the most dangerous jobs imaginable and I would also say that the police and the firefighters they need to be fairly treated and you're damn right they should be able to form unions and you're damn right they should be able to stand up for decent working conditions for the cops, the firefighters, and the rest of the first responders. <laughs> the police protect us from anarchy. And, I, and, I, and I'm and i sorry, I'm not interested in any arguments that the police and the firefighters should not be able to form unions and stand up for themselves. Plain and simple. One fool at a time. And I would also say the following regarding the Green Party, which I also heard talked about tonight. In 2018 was the last time I attended a meeting right before the November election. So we had somebody here from the Green Party who was running for the water reclamation district board. Tim, well, if I started too long, you shut me up. No, you've got another minute left. Okay. And it turned, first of all, one of their speakers didn't show up. The other speaker who did talked about his hobbies and himself, but he didn't seem to know very much about the water reclamation district board that he was running for. He talked about the need to regulate air pollution. The district regulates water pollution and it treats our and it treats our wastewater. Yeah. And it turned out as a citizen, I knew more about what the district does than he did. <laughs> yeah. And he's running for this kind of an office, and at no time did he come out and say what the Democrats on the boards are doing are doing wrong, what he would do differently if he were elected to the board. He didn't make his case. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I voted right, decided right then and there to vote for the Democratic ticket for the Water Reclamation District Board, just like I did this year. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're going up next. You go next. You got something to say. You're going to go up next. This is. 
All right, go uh, ahead. Three I mean, minutes. Uh, 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 I would, I would just like to say about uh, the unions. Like the speakers in, uh, in the unions. I believe in the unions. I certainly believe in the right to unionize. Uh, I believe in uh, the benefits, fair benefits, and I believe in fair salaries for union workers. What I don't believe in is outrageous pension for union government, union workers. And by outrageous, I mean they are not, uh, they are not in line, anywhere in line with the private sector. And when a policeman, who I, the, I respect the police, I respect the firemen, but when a policeman and other government workers are with just regularity, being able, being given a $5 million pension, okay? When you're, when you put in 25 years and then you're able to get a six figure pension after being a, a, a fireman and retire after 20 years, there's something wrong here. It's just too much. It's not in, in line with, uh, with what others uh, are getting. And uh, that's, that's where, uh, and as, uh, as as Mike said, everyone knows what the deal with the unions is. They've uh, they've gotten the Democratic Party, and I don't blame them. You're a union. You you try and get as much as you can, and that's what they've done. And they've gotten all the Democratic politicians, so they just kicked everything uh, down the road. And that's why the, the 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 pension plans in Illinois and the bank in the state of Illinois were fiftieth. In terms of underfunding, out of fifty states, fifty. You know, people used to laugh at, uh, you know, like Mississippi or something. Illinois is the laughing stock. You know, and as Mike said, it's county, city, state. It's total financial incompetence and irresponsibility. And it's uh, uh, it, all of this goes to the to the union coffers. Okay, and it's too much. Okay, all right. I'm gonna stir the pot next for about three minutes. If uh, I know what's in it, you threw me on the spot. Then I got a rebuttal. All right, Kelvin. Uh, let me give give me a minute while I put the mic next to the speakers. Okay. Okay. Give me a second, please. We'll get you on. We'll get you right on. We'll give you three minutes. Two. One two. One two. Second, Kelvin. Two. Two. I got one, two. Two. One two. All right, Kelvin. You're gonna go next. I got All the right. um, speakers, so uh, um, uh, I've heard a few speakers. I came in a little bit late with them. Okay, hang on, hang on. So no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you a story from a different country, and it's not mine, um, and it's not yours. So I did a job for a guy who's um, half Norwegian, and uh, he told me this story. A man doesn't pay his electric bill. This guy doesn't pay his electric bill. Now, what would happen most in both our countries is you probably just get cut off, but not in Norway. High tax country, what you might call socialist. Well, certainly very social democratic. What the electricity company does is they send out a couple of people, well, man and woman, I think, uh, to, go, to knock, actually knock on his door because they looked at his bill. And he's always been a regular, he'd been a, he'd been a regular payer for decades. And now suddenly he's, he's not paying his bill. Why? They sent a couple of people, knocked on his door. Turned out his wife had left him. He turned to drink, which is a very expensive habit in, in Norway. Let me, let me tell you. Uh, and he's uh, it basically, he's like, he's like gone, to, gone to pass. So, the electricity company, they contacted some social workers and the social worker came around and, um, and you know, got them cleaned up maybe, you know, and so let's, you know, we're going into rehab, you know, just some counselling, some, you know, get over this and all that kind of stuff. And they, they fixed them up a job on the railway with, a, he lost his house, then, you know, and all, all of that gone, you know. But they fixed them up with a, a job on the railway, which had uh, its own accommodation. And, um, the guy ended up being a productive member of society again, paying taxes at a high rate for all the other poor bugs that maybe their wife had left them. Um, if you want to scale it down a bit, 
you know, a system like that was is open to abuse. That's for sure. For sure. But there's a reason why Britain has more, better music than than America. I don't say pro, pro per capita. Okay, don't get me wrong. I absolutely adore Chicago music. I've got chess records in my mind collection. Honestly, I love Chicago music. But per capita, we're on a par, and we're a fifth of your size, man. The reason is you can perform a band on the dole. I finished. Okay. Uh all right, Kelvin, with, with that, we're going to uh, go to our next rebutter here, if you don't mind. Um, we appreciate your, uh, your your clear tonight. Okay, Andy, if you want to grab the mic, re re put it up there and uh, get set. Go ahead, remount it, please. And I'll start your three minutes upon your first speaking your words. Thank you, Andy. Just... Uh, and then secure it again, if you don't mind. We thank you, sir. For those of you that are Star Trek fans, uh, there's an episode of uh, Jafal, uh, the ball visiting Earth way back in the early days of space travel. And uh, she actually, uh, gave the idea of Velcro to uh, uh, a banker uh, to get money to pay for the college education <laughs> of a guy in a poor town where uh, she and another Vulcan were uh, stranded on Earth. So that's where the Velcro came from. Anyway, <clears throat> there's a few elephants in the room that people seem to miss or gloss over whenever you're talking about what's happening in America. One, one giant elephant in the room stinking up the place that nobody talks about <laughs> is America's number one on the planet. Number one is shoveling money to the rich people and letting poor people die because the rich people want their billions. We're number one. We have a wealth transfer system shoveling money to billionaires since 1980 when Ronald Reagan took office. The idea of trickle-down economics, uh, some people call it unregulated capitalism. Same thing, unregulated capitalism, many many authors have pointed out, is simply a cult of death. Martin Luther King said, any society that spends more money on the machinery of death, the military, than you spend on living conditions is heading towards spiritual death. Well, we're here. We've got 75 million people that are in the cult of MAGA, and they're what we call antichrist Christians. They call themselves Christians, but don't help the poor, let them die. Don't help the sick, let them die. Just the opposite of what Jesus thought. Number two, people don't realize this historical facts that Tom Hartman has been pointing out for a long time that no Republican person has got control of the presidency since Eisenhower without massive treason and criminal corruption. There have been no honest elections of people who honestly voted for a Republican office without massive treason and shaking the vote and everything else. For the last 12 out of the last 20 years, between 2000 and 2020, or two, actually from 1980 to 2020, for eight years, we had no president. Ronald Reagan wore the suit and masqueraded as the president while Dick Cheney and the others, Donald Rumsfeld, they ran the criminal enterprise. From 2000 to 2008, we had no president, no vice president. We had two corporate criminals filling those slots and filling the suits, masquerading as president and vice president. And then from 2016 to 2020, we had what I called, <clears throat> you think of Donald Trump and Joe the Plumber. What do they have in common? Could you take Joe the Plumber and put a white coat and tie on him and make him head of Mount, a brain surgery at Mount Sinai. Would you want to be worked on as a surgeon if it was Joe the plumber that was picked off the street? No qualifications at all for the job. Well, Donald Trump was number one in two categories. He had the least number of qualifications, minimal that were necessary to actually do the job of presidency. He had none of that. Number one, the second thing, he had the most qualifications psychopathic tendencies, basic liar, <laughs> no ethics, morals, and conscience, 
long time mobbed up corporate criminal doing money laundering for the Russian mob and the American mob okay. for 30 years. He had all the qualifications necessary. Any one of them okay. should have caused him to chucked out of the office within 72 hours mm -hmm. of hitting the Oval Office. Okay. What okay. happened to the oath when I saw it in Congress? Okay. One more. All right, Andy, I'll give you a little. I, th I think you do what they said with some plumbers. All right. Uh, I'm going to allow him another another second or two, and then we'll get There's, back to us. Everybody missed the, uh, it was, it's, some people have missed the point that we have cheap cell phones today that used to be $1,500. Well, now they're, you know, they're good ones, cheap, even for 50 bucks. The same thing has happened to alternative energy and alternative energy things that we fossil fuels. The ratio is 10,000 to one in energy intake from the sun, big fusion reactor out there versus what the human race uses. And it's a, it's a do documented fact that nobody seems to want to study that no nuclear power plant on this planet has ever turned a profit selling kilowatts. They've been propped up by welfare money from the defense department of each country that runs them nuclear power, nuclear weapons okay. are uh, part and parcel of the same, same industry. Does everybody understand that? So, uh, and also since 1988, okay. the, the alternatives to nuclear power are cheaper than the daily operating cost of a nuclear power plant, even if okay. the plant is free. Okay. Those are all facts that we need to uh, accept. Okay. We're going to have to cut you off there because okay. it's over three minutes. Uh, there'll be other, uh, who, okay, go ahead. Thank you much. Uh, Ellen, go ahead. Please, please. All right, Ellen, you've got three minutes. It will be good. It's just had a lot of caffeine. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to talk briefly about that first amendment on the ballot um, about um, the unions and it, part of the language is that there's there's nothing that the any of uh, the local or the county or the state government can do to ever diminish the power of um, people to unionize and to bargain for uh, rights. Um, and I don't know, I've just been reading a little bit about it and I just, it occurred to me that I think that, you know, that's, it's a little bit extreme considering it's a constitutional amendment, um, Illinois constitutional amendment, um, that at some point, you know, like let's suppose they, you know, the workers were um, arguing that uh, we're trying to bargain and saying that, oh, you know, teachers shouldn't have to pass a, have a background check or, you know, some just very basic things, you know, they shouldn't um, have to have any kind of education in order to teach or, or whatever. And um, it, yeah, I, I think that, um, Right now, workers are, you know, public sector workers are allowed to, um, you know, you know, they're, they're pretty strong. I mean, they're, they're allowed to um, fairly negotiate things. Um, so I, I was, don't really, I think this amendment is a little bit extreme. Um, and um, the, the other thing that's part of it, um, the amendment is that they're saying that um, it, it would eliminate Illinois ever being a uh, right to work um, state, um, which, you know, right, you know, right to work means that, you know, um, sorry, uh, right to work means that, you know, um, um, members of a shop, um, of an employment that they, um, you know, right right now in Illinois, they don't necessarily have to join the union, and but the, they could make it a law that it's a uh, right to work, and therefore they definitely wouldn't be required to join the union. Um, so that that's another issue. But um, I was just thinking that it, it it seems kind of extreme. We don't know what the What's needs the will be in a hundred years. What's the extreme? Yeah, I mean we don't know what our, our needs will be, and it seems like in the future maybe government may want to do some restrictions on, on the ability of, of workers to negotiate. 
Well, I am actually very pro union. Okay, thanks. All right. I'm going to need somebody to watch me because I'm going to give a rebuttal here in a minute. Go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. First of all, I want to thank I want to thank our keynote speakers. All right. They did a good job. And I'm going to be collecting as usual here. Uh, when the parties come together and have collective bargaining, either side can present proposals. Under the structure of the law, the rights, the employees have rights, the employer, the employees have rights, and you bargain in good faith. And you said extremism, you did not cite one example. Not one example. You can make a thousand proposals. I write those. I've done it for, for years. Does it mean that I, what I write is automatically adopted? Right now, there's extremism on the side of the unions. Can you give give me one example? That teacher, who do you think I get makes the requirements on the right to hire? It's the employer. The employer. And they, yeah, they have, and they want no restrictions. That's why they can hire their, their son. Don't you know that? They have no restrictions on the right to hire. That's what the employer wants. And if you think that's what you want, that's wonderful. Just like my friend, I have to get a job. And one day the boss comes along and says, we don't need you anymore because we're bringing in my daughter to replace you. And that's what the extremism you're up against. All right, I'm gonna get a few more here. I've heard that um, um, unions have undue influence. Uh, and the employer has the right to veto collective bargaining and valid union elections held among grown men and women. And the, the employer unilaterally can say, no, I nullify and veto anything you can do. This is, we're, we're arguing back to the days of the 19th century where the employer could do anything. I, I'm always reminded, I just think about this fact, the employers could do anything. In the steel mills, in the Carnegie Steel Mills, United States Steel, one employee died per week. Nothing was done about it because he could, then we can't veto what the owner of the company does. He should have been held on criminal charges and nothing was done. He operated with impunity. He made, he became the richest person in the United States as a result of that activity. And nothing was done to check it. And you say, the employer, the, oh, the employers, oh, we can't do anything to check okay. their influence. Where's your sense of history? All right, Charlie. Mass shooting, no, let me finish. Mass shooting, done. mass shootings here. Oh, oh, they're about, let's see, there's something like 400 per year. Let's do the math. That's about eight per week. It's not enough for you. And that's media hype. Uh, Ernie here. No. Oh, uh, it's mass shooting. Who cares about that? Yeah. Um, that was his point. No, it isn't. Right. Point. That and, and it was just media hype. And you're committing no time deal. theft now, Charlie. Um, yeah, more weapons, more weapons. Okay. Bring about more violence. It's simple. I don't know All what right. the problem is with that. Okay, um, Charlie, your three minutes are up. No, I'm going. I going on the floor. Well, we, we heard this guy going on. Uh, federal unions are under. Who do you think funds unions? The government. If it's over or under funding, that's not just the employees. Not the Don't government. you understand that? People. The employees are funded. Why can't you fire a teacher or a Okay, okay. And you can be fired. Anybody wants to right. have a job. Charlie, your time is up. Since they leave. Your time is up, you Charlie. Time is up, Charlie. Your time is it, up, it Charlie. Take effect right away. Like those quiet you know that? Okay. Okay. Has anybody got a hope? Stuck You're done. Done. You're done. Done. Has anybody got a hope? You're done. All right, next next speaker. Go ahead. Come on. Butter and jelly available on the counter if anyone needs it. 
Plus Garden. Uh, there's been a lot said tonight, so I'll have to chase after a few different things. Uh, Charlie, I'm sure that no steel workers ever died in Magnitogorsk uh, or any socialist steel mill. I'm sure that only happened in Carnegie Steel Mill. I am speaking, goddamn you, and you will not interrupt me, sir. I am making light of the Soviet Union, and you will listen to every word I say. Uh, I have married into a Chicago Teachers Union family, not my wife, but uh, my mother-in-law. However, I think even they would admit that they had a lot of sympathy in, in 2012 with the strike then, first teacher strike in 25 years at that time, and with multiple strikes over the following decade, they really lost a lot of Chicago public sympathy this last spring. It was the, Chicago was suddenly becoming libertarian with the capital L, but it meant that they were out of patience with the seats of leadership, and the caucus that governs the CTU core uh, reshuffled their leadership so that Jesse Sharkey would become the president of the union again. And now they have a new face on the CTU because he wore out his welcome. Um, that already took up a lot of time. Uh, the Tom Hartman argument about the, well, this is the year that you have to vote for the Democrat straight ticket. And I'm sorry, that was even quoted from Ralph Nader when Andy had brought that up earlier. No, well, Noam Chomsky's, you know, 95 and uh, morally questionable in a lot of things, but we'll leave him out of this. Uh, well, he's dead. Daniel Ellsberg, I believe, is dead. Is <laughs> now, my, my apologies. We're down to a minute 17. So um, you have a two-party system nationwide. I'm not denying that the Republican Party has gone way off the deep end and kind of bizarrely neo-fascist in recent years, especially part of the reason I went to a third party, and got active in a third party. But what you also have between gerrymandering and a number of other things is a local one party system. So the stance that you're taking against fascist current in the Republican party, if you're also just recycling crappy politicians like Susanna Mendoza and your local crummy state rep, uh, you know, your incumbent county commissioner who's a face, who, who is a, a yard sign with no face uh, and just a name on the yard sign. That is really hitting the snooze button on a lot of democracy. And I would submit to you is sowing the seeds of the angry populist reaction later on. So that's where, you know, take a risk further down the ballot uh, if you would like. Uh, this is, I think, a fairly safe state and a fairly safe county. So that's a relatively low risk. I tried to pepper a few other comments in there, uh, but I will say just because I'm supporting this ticket, we did this without a lot of money. We are self-funded, we are a lot of volunteers, and we put in a lot of effort in the cold to get people on the ballot, to get those 1,500 signatures, to be able to pay a rather modest you know, chapter <coughs> treasury sometimes to have to litigate against the Cook County Clerk's Office. And they tried to keep us off the ballot. James Nally, I love you, buddy. He's the lawyer for the Cook County Clerk's Office. Anyway, we'll see y'all later. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> no, normally at this time, we uh, will let our speakers make the last remarks. But uh, I'm afraid that we're going to have to uh, shut down at this point because the restaurant does close at 9. It's 740. It's at 8 now. Eight. I'm sorry, at 8. It's only 740. Yeah, I know, but we got a quarter till we got to start backing up the equipment and everything else. So I'll just uh, close out the college with this. It has been said that a fool is not interested in understanding, but only in the revealing of his own mind. Well, I'm a fool too, but I reveal it quite well because of Toastmasters. With that, gentlemen, we're going to adjourn to college tonight. Uh, thank you all for showing up. And for those of you on Zoom, we'll see you guys uh, next week. And again, the college is adjourned. Kelvin, if you want to, if somebody wants to take over the hosting duties, I can leave the Zoom call open.
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know where okay, you're going to go. Kelvin, I'm going to make you host then, okay? Okay, fair enough. I've got, um, then, uh, I'm, in the middle of, I'm in the middle of just selling some rum anyway, so I'm going to be okay. Okay, awesome. Kelvin, I, I, you're your host. You guys online can remain. I got to leave. So, Kelvin, uh, take over. Okay. He's on a Zoom call. Let me re stop the recording here. Kelvin, stop the, stop the recording, Kelvin. Uh, okay, how do we do that? Do you know how to do uh, that? Phone stop recording. Okay, stop. Okay, you got it. Stop now. Okay.